Good morning, everyone. This is Jamie Upson from Stonehearth Capital Management. Uh, I'm always excited about these webinars. Uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for us to uh, get together and have clients and friends over on the West Coast joining us uh, and clients here on the East Coast. It's, uh, it's always nice when this stuff works. Uh, I do want to give out a special thanks to Amanda, my colleague, uh, for organizing most of the slides for us and as well as organizing this webinar. Uh, without her, it would be a lot more challenging for me. Um, a couple of housekeeping line items. On your GoToMeeting toolbar, there is a chat box. If you have any questions on anything that we're discussing today, uh, you can just go ahead and submit a chat and it will send it to us. If we don't get a chance uh, to answer your question, it does tell us who submitted the chat so we can always follow up with you uh, separately. Uh, this is the first webinar that we're hosting for 2017. It's an idea that we had and planned on about six months ago where we received a lot of we receive and have received a lot of feedback from our clients uh, pertaining to what subject matters they'd like to hear more about. Uh, and so what we decided to do is to host monthly educational campaigns where we'll dive into each one of those subjects in more detail. Uh, it's something that if we have a lot of success with this that we'll continue to roll out uh, each month going forward and we'll be taking polls and we'll be looking at the stats to see how many people are participating, how many people are attending, uh, and getting feedback uh, from you. So please uh, feel free to send us notes on that. Uh, we'd love to hear about it. Um, this particular, well, we'll talk first about uh, what you should be seeing on your screen. Let me just double check and make sure that you can see this. You should be able to. Uh, right on our home page, you can actually see that there's a list of our upcoming webinars that we're hosting for the year. If you click on this button, uh, you'll see a quick tutorial video on the one that we're doing today, which you should have already received, but then you'll see each one of the monthly campaigns that we're running. The cool part is right here, if you find that you want to attend the educational planning seminar, if you just hit register now, it will go ahead and it will uh, uh, reserve that spot for you and it will send you a reminder when we come close to September 28th. Uh, that way you can just sign up for any of the ones that you want. As a reminder, they're always free. Uh, and they will be recorded as well. I want to uh, change over to this particular webinar that we're going to be discussing today. Let me just switch this over to slide presentation. And this one is the New Year's Financial Resolution. We thought that this would be pretty appropriate given the new year. Uh, and this being January. Uh, and in particular, we're going to address what each generation needs to know. Uh, you know, each of us have unique stories that help to define who we are, but while the details might be unique, uh, the circumstances upon which we find ourselves, they're oftentimes anything but unique. Uh, you know, if we talk about lots of college graduates leave with student loans, uh, many couples decide to have children, uh, most people want to stop working someday, uh, and at some point we all pass away. Uh, it is with these broad strokes that we will address most of the important issues that each generation faces. So in this month's report, it's not designed to be all-inclusive. There are a whole host of issues that we purposefully left off uh, on this webinar just to keep it short and concise. The areas that we highlight uh, in this webinar will cover a handful of issues that are going to apply to every, just about everybody. It's a great starter towards meeting your financial goals. It is the only the beginning, though. Each of you do need to assess your own personal situations and seek help as needed. Here are a list of the generations that we broke out and the ones that we're going to address. Obviously, if you're on this call and you happen to fall within Gen Z or you're a baby boomer, you're going to obviously want to hear or hone in on the discussions that we'll, that we'll review uh, when we talk on that subject. But, you know, a lot of us have friends or family members who they are, fall within another generation and their section will obviously be more relevant to them. So feel free uh, to share this webinar. We're also going to be including a white paper at the end that you can also share with others. The first group uh, that we're going to discuss is Gen Z. Uh, and as I learned from uh, uh, Survivor, I don't know if anybody watched the most recent season of Survivor, they did uh, Gen X versus the Millennials. 
and someone actually pointed out the fact that many times they don't even know what these next generations are going to be called, which is why you see iGen, Gen Z, or the Centennials. Nothing has stuck yet, um, so we'll soon find out, or we will find out as time goes on, just, just what they'll actually call themselves or what people will refer to them. Uh, to. They were born in 1996 and later, uh, and they're 0 to 20 years of age. Uh, I think the important thing to remember for this generation, and in general, is that money is a tool. It helps you do the things that you want to do in life. Uh, the more you want, the more you're going to need. Most people, they want to retire someday, and this requires years of discipline and sacrifice. The good news is that the earlier that you start to save towards a goal, the easier it is to reach that goal. The reason why saving early is so effective is because of the benefits of compounding growth. Uh, a lot of people do know what compounded growth is, but for those that don't, it's just simply being able to grow today on money that you made last year. Uh, let's take a look at an example to just see how beneficial compound and growth can be. Let's assume you want to retire at age 65 with $1 million, and you feel that you can grow your money at 7% per year. If you start saving towards this goal at age 25, then you need to save about $5,000 a year. If you delay until age 45, then you need to save about $25,000 a year. This is quite a difference. Gen Z uh, will have a whole host of tools available to them to help them track their finances. As I was editing some of my slides, I was sort of laughing because I was sitting there on my MacBook Pro uh, and sitting next to my daughter, and she was also on a MacBook uh, doing her homework. And it just, you know, this generation is just used to using computers. Technology does not scare them one bit. Um, one of the more important areas for everyone, but I think in particular for Gen Z, uh, is that they need to consistently monitor their checking accounts. Uh, in early years, as we begin our careers, many many people will, or, or money will be tight for many people, uh, and for for many, they'll be living check to check. This is vitally important that you pay extra close attention to your checking account to make sure that checks don't bounce. One of the tools that our clients use is a software called eMoney. Uh, this tool has the ability to set up low balance alerts, which will trigger a notification to its user if a particular amount balance falls below a certain threshold. This is a good start. The tools are getting better and better. Another good, good idea for this generation is to start tracking expenses and constructing budgets to help them save, to help them monitor where their money is going and when. Once again, leverage the tools available to help you towards this lifelong exercise. This is something that you're going to need to do forever, but I think it, it's particularly helpful for Gen Z to start right out of the gate learning how important this monitoring process is. If there is one area of financial abuse that runs rampant in our society, it is the improper use of credit cards. Who doesn't want a free t-shirt when all you have to do is open up a new credit card? I can still remember the days when I was in college coming out of the CAF and there would be booths that were set up uh, where you could get some kind of gift for opening up a credit card. Uh, and now, you know, looking back, it obviously seems funny. Uh, if used correctly, credit cards can be a blessing. Uh, however, if they're used incorrectly, it can be a curse. We all have close friends and relatives who have gotten themselves into trouble with credit cards. Don't fall into this trap. Only put expenses on the card that you can pay in full. Preferably monthly, but certainly no longer than three months. And sync your credit cards with your budgeting software to see and track just where you are spending your hard-earned money. You will be surprised. I know that my wife and I do track all of our expenses. We use the eMoney portal. And it's, it is relatively simple. I mean, it does require you to, to recode some of the transactions uh, that, that get automatically fed into the software. But it's, it's, it is eye-opening to see how much you sp spend on certain things like groceries or some of the loans or things like that. I'm going to switch gears over to the millennials, which are also referred to as Gen Y. And these are individuals between the ages of 21 and 39 years of age. I think uh, a big issue for them is that they need to build emergency reserves. Far too often, 
uh, people do not have one. And this is true for a lot of different age back brackets and generations. Uh, when the car breaks down or medical bills are due, most people turn to their credit cards to cover these costs. Try to build reserves anywhere between three and six months, months worth of expenses that you can park in a high yielding money market. And I know that's a, a strange phrase these days, high yielding money market, but it will get better. Use three months if your job security is high, and I would suggest using 12 months of emergency reserves uh, if your job security is not so good. Funds within qualified retirement plans like a 401k do not qualify as emergency reserves. They should be reserved for retirement. All too often I hear of people getting into trouble and they tap their retirement plans. And I get it, I understand that if that's the, op the option of last resort and you don't have an emergency reserves, then that is something that you need to, 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 uh, to dip into. But if you do plan ahead and you are able to build some uh, emergency reserves, then it will prevent you from having to do that. Budgeting. Budgeting is important. Uh, treat your finances as if, as if you're running a business. If you hired someone to handle your company's finances and he or she could not tell you where each dollar is going, then you would more likely you would be more inclined to let that person go if they could not tell you where your money's going. There are plenty of online tools, as I mentioned, to help you monitor them. As I mentioned above, we use eMoney to help our clients do this with budgets uh, and with tracking their finances. Hopefully, you have learned from your parents that saving early for your retirement is a good idea. A reasonable goal for somebody in this generation should be to save about 10% of their income towards retirement. Again, make sure you take advantage of employer 401ks or 403bs or 457 plans, which hopefully offer an employer matching contribution. Remember, the matching contribution is free money that everyone should take advantage of. The later you start saving, the more you need to save, so start early. If and when you decide to get married or raise a family, it's important to consider purchasing life insurance. I typically recommend that people purchase between 10 and 15 times their salary. Of course, some of this is subjective, but I think that's a pretty reasonable range. They also need to look at health insurance and disability insurance. And again, when it comes to disability insurance, I usually look for people to purchase and replace 60 to 70 percent within a long-term disability insurance plan. These will ensure that you have resources available for your loved ones if and when problems arise. Also, give consideration to establishing an estate plan, which should include language within your will identifying who should take care of your children in the event that you and or your spouse pass away. Finally, for this generation, I would give consideration to saving for their children's education. And 529 college savings plans are a great option. We're going to switch gears over to Generation X, which is my own generation now that I just recently turned 41. Um, many of the necessary items that millennials need to focus on still hold true for Gen Xers. You need to determine if you are on track with each of your goals. Um, for example, if you're saving enough for your children's education. For most of us, the answer is probably not. College is so expensive these days. The, the, the most recent stat that I've seen for a four-year private education is about $250,000. Um, so obviously that's a, that's a pretty large expense and a pretty lofty goal if you're trying to fully fund that education. Uh, the good news is uh, we are going to be holding another seminar or webinar in September where David Giuliano will host uh, this event and he's going to focus on education planning. For those that don't know David, he's another advisor with our firm. He's been with us for over a year uh, and David in his prior position actually traveled the country talking about educational planning needs uh, and as well as financial aid eligibility. Uh, going back to getting back to Gen X and what they need to focus on as you get older the need for life insurance should wane as your retirement nest egg grows but until then continue to maintain life insurance coverage on both spouses as I said before 
the general rule of thumb is 10 to 15 times your salary should be sufficient. So if you make $100,000, then you should consider getting a policy with a death benefit between 1 million and 1.5 million. Even those stay-at-home mothers, they should also maintain coverage. Uh, you know, just try and find someone out there that will perform all the, the functions and duties that they do, and, and you'll be shocked at how much that would that would cost you. Uh, we find that term insurance is the most appropriate type of insurance to utilize in most of these situations. Approximately half of the states in the U.S. charge estate taxes. Massachusetts just happens to be one of them. Lucky us. Uh, if and when you pass away and you leave money to a non-spouse for more than $1 million, which remember you got to include your life insurance here, then estate taxes may be owed. If, you're a straight, if your estate is greater than the exempt amount of $1 million uh, within your state, then you should visit a local estate planning attorney to discuss ways to reduce your estate tax exposure. So again, if you, if you have over a million dollars, including the life insurance, uh, and you're a couple, it's worth giving, uh, taking the time to sit down with an attorney to just explore the issues uh, and explore ways that you can reduce your exposure. Uh, just to let you know, at the federal level, the exempt amount for a couple is about $11 million. So for most of us, federal tax, estate taxes are, are no longer or are not currently an issue. It does warrant watching this because as time goes on, we've seen that in, at least in the past, that this number has jumped around quite a bit. In, in October, I'm going to be hosting a webinar on estate planning uh, in which I'll go into greater detail on estate taxes and how to reduce uh, your estate tax exposure. Gen X needs to make sure that they take time to teach their children about the value of money, savings, the benefits of compounding growth, balancing a checkbook, and how to respond to responsibly use credit cards. Again, credit cards can be an amazing tool if we're taught early how to use them properly. If you're not talk talking to your children about these things, then who is? We're going to switch gears now and go to the baby boomers. Uh, baby boomers are between the ages of 52 and 70. This is the group that is uh, predominantly in the retirement phase or, or, or they're the ones that are probably most concerned uh, with retirement issues. For those on the younger side of this generation, take advantage of these final years before retirement to give it that final push to help prepare yourself for a successful retirement. Fortunately, these are usually your highest earning years. You may still be dealing with the hangover of college expenses, but this too shall pass. In June, I'll be hosting a webinar regarding retirement income planning, which continues to be our number one question we receive from prospective clients. Uh, the, the typical statement we get is somebody is looking to see if they can afford to retire. Uh, it's as simple as that, but yet to answer that question is not so simple and requires putting together a retirement planning analysis. As we get older, it makes sense to consider reducing your portfolio's risk profile. At our firm, we discuss a client's risk profile at just about every meeting to ensure that we are taking a prudent approach to meeting their financial goals. We call it Know Your Risk Score. Look to see how your current portfolio would, would have performed during a repeat of 2008. Are you okay with this? If not, consider making changes. If this is not an area that you are willing to commit time, energy, and resources, then, it can, then consider hiring a professional. Next month, our Chief Investment Officer, Chris Gauthier, will host a webinar regarding these risk scores. You will have some very important decision, decisions ahead of you that are not always black and white, but instead shades of gray. For example, when will you pay for assisted living or nurse, nursing home care in the event that you or your spouse get sick? I'm sorry, it's how will you pay for assisted living or nursing home care in the event that you or your spouse get sick? Medical insurance will not pay for most of these expenses. If you want insurance to cover these kinds of expenses, you need to consider long-term care insurance. These policies are expensive and not for everyone, but it's worth exploring to give you a chance to proactively decide for or against purchasing this type of policy. In March, I will be discussing uh, during our webinar uh, the issues of nursing homes and how to protect your assets. 
When it comes to claiming Social Security benefits, the, the decisions are extremely complex. This is one of those that when I started in the business, I thought it seemed pretty straightforward, and boy was I wrong. Uh, there are so many different claiming decisions. A lot of them have actually been, or a healthy number of them, were actually eliminated uh, back in October 2015, which has been going through a phase out. So there are still a lot of individuals that can make use of those uh, strategies. But needs to say, even without these, these strategies that are expiring, there are still a whole bunch of claiming decisions. You need to commit a lot of time, energy, and resources to do your homework on this subject, or once again, hire a professional. Uh, David Giuliano is going to be hosting a, a webinar in April, and where he'll be discussing Social Security planning. At age 65, you will most likely need to sign up for Medicare. If you need help, you should check with your state to see what resources are available to help you weigh your options. As again, as I mentioned earlier, we have clients in a lot of states joining us today. However, in Massachusetts, we have a wonderful group called Shine that you can meet with. Uh, we'll be, I'll be showing you where the white paper is, and right within the white paper, you can actually find the number for Shine so that you can reach out if this is something of interest to you. As your parents grow older, new challenges will arise, and you may be bearing the brunt of it trying to help them find solutions. Consider scheduling a family meeting while cooler heads prevail to make sure you understand their wishes. What are their feelings about moving into a retirement community or senior housing? Have they recently updated, the, updated their estate planning documents? In particular, maybe their health care proxy or their durable power of attorney need to be updated. Do they have long-term care insurance? See where this discussion takes you. Let's move on to the traditionalists or the silent generation. Uh, these are individuals age 71 or older. It's time to grab that old dusty binder, a cup of coffee, and a comfortable chair because it's time to read through your estate planning documents. Yeah, I know this is not necessarily the most fun thing to do, but at the same token, uh, it's actually something that it's super important. You can get through this while most of it might seem like a foreign language, the most important parts will actually uh, are, are actually very readable. You'll be able to see what they are and, and identify what I think are the most important parts of naming who you're going to appoint in these documents, who you're going to name as beneficiaries, uh, and even if you're incorporating trusts or other provisions in the wills, you actually, I, th I find that those are actually fairly simple to follow. Um, review the names within each document to make sure that each person is still living and that you are comfortable with them fulfilling the role you have outlined for them. Again, these are within these estate planning documents. Make sure that you also have successor individuals listed just in case. What about beneficiaries? Are they still living? What about your beneficiary designations on your retirement accounts and life insurance policies? Do you have successors on them as well? If you and your spouse have over $11 million, then you may be subject to federal estate taxes. If you have over $1 million in Massachusetts, you may be subject to Massachusetts estate taxes. Check the exemption amounts in your state to see if your, your estate is over the amount. Don't forget to include your life insurance proceeds. Review your estate plan every three to five years, preferably with your estate planning attorney. But as I mentioned before, the most important parts are actually uh, not that bad to go, th to go over. I, I actually find that most people can get through it. Uh, so I suggest everybody do that, dust it off every three to five years. Trusts come in many different flavors. Some trusts are designed to help reduce estate taxes, while others are designed to shelter assets from a nursing home. The vast majority of people have neither of these, but instead have revocable trusts that help avoid probate. It all depends upon what your goals are. Your goals will help dictate whether or not a trust would be beneficial. In July, I'll be hosting a webinar on the ABCs of trust. This is one of the other top questions that we receive from clients. When you turn 70 and a half, you will be required to take required minimum distributions from your retirement accounts. This means that you have to take a minimum amount out of each retirement account so, they, so that the IRS can tax you on these distributions. This is all about making sure that you pay taxes on these funds. 
because up until this point you haven't paid taxes. This is an annual requirement. It usually starts at about 4.5% of your portfolio's value, but increases each year. The penalties are steep if you fail to take the distribution, so don't forget. You should review your financial plan annually. For our clients that we have, this is something that we do on an annual basis. In particular, you want to make sure that the withdrawals you take from your portfolio are still within a comfortable range so that your portfolio outlasts you. Your financial plan gives you a glimpse into the future to help you make informed decisions today. The earlier you address the need for change, the less dramatic the change will need to be. Once again, in June, I'll be going uh, over retirement income planning in the in the again June webinar to address these concerns. Finally, get together with your estate planning team to run through a dress rehearsal pretending that you pass away. Does your team know where to find your estate planning binder? Do you know? Uh, do you know? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, do they know, I'm sorry, do they know who they should call? Uh, if, if your spouse is not financially savvy, does he or she know who to turn to for help? Now is your chance to fill in the blanks because after you are gone, your team will only have your playbook to turn to. If something is not clear, they are going to have to make a judgment call themselves, which you may or may not agree with. We're going to swing this over to question and answers. Just a reminder, uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and submit something within the chats. I do want to point out and show you where you can find this white paper. So again, if you just go to our website, the webinars are down here. The white paper is right here. So if you go to Education, White Paper Archive, You'll actually see it right here and you can download it. And this is something that you can share uh, with your friends or family members, uh, especially if they happen to be in a different generation that might be more applicable for them, uh, that they want to hear about. Uh, it depends on what's going on in their lives. The next steps, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I hope that people do get a lot out of, out of uh, the white paper and these kind of events. Uh, our goal is to make sure that these stay interesting, informative, and, informative and, and most of all reassuring. While retirement and financial strategizing is complex, we want to present some reminders so we can begin answering important questions about your journey based on where you are in your life. Most of all, we want to encourage and support you as you address each of these challenges and, and prepare for the next stage of your life. Why don't we open it right now to any questions? I think Amanda's going to join us and potentially read off some of those questions, I believe. Hi, Jamie. Just a reminder to everybody to use the chat box or the question box to go ahead and send over your questions. And if we don't get to your question today, um, it does let us know who asked it. So we will follow up with you at, at the end of the webinar to make sure we get to everyone's questions. So the first one that I have here, Jamie, is about e-money. Uh, you mentioned e-money and how it can help you track your expenses and building budgets. Can you elaborate on this? Yep. Uh, I've been a huge fan now uh, for e-money, which we started using maybe five, six years ago. Uh, the primary reason that we, that we started using it is because it does what's called account aggregation, which means that no matter, well, it, there's very, I've found very few exceptions to this. As long as you can find an account, whether it's a credit card, a checking account, uh, a savings account, an investment account, your 401k, your mortgage, your home equity line of credit. As long as you can log in and view that information online, eMoney should be able to sync that data so that every day that, that those balances come into your software and into your financial plan. Uh, that's a pretty powerful tool. It's also available on your phone or, or your tablet or just using a straight regular laptop or computer. Uh, it also maintains your financial plan. One of the cool parts of it, though, is as if you sync your checking account and your credit card, it does pull in, right away it actually pulls in, I believe, six months worth of back history so that it will give you something that you can work with to start building out your budgets. Again, it'll show you a transaction, a list of transactions 
for each line item, every check that you've written, every ATM withdrawal, every uh, visit to the to the grocery store that you've used your credit card, and it creates a line item for that. And you categorize it. You save that category, that category so that when it sees that transaction again from market basket, it will know that that's supposed to be related to groceries. And then what it does is each month or every six months or every, every year, it will show you how much you're spending on that particular, within that particular category. You can create as many categories as you want. They have a whole bunch of canned ones that are available, which makes sense. Um, but the cool part is you can then take that information and start building out budgets. So if you want to start spending less on groceries, if you're currently spending $1,000 a month on groceries and you want to spend $800, well, it will start monitoring that for you and will tell you throughout the month how, how are you on track for your goal. I think that's a pretty powerful tool uh, for all generations, but I think it's a particularly helpful one for Gen Z. Uh, so that they can start to learn these traits early on. Um, I, th I think that's helpful. The, the final thing that, that eMoney does is it also does, as I mentioned earlier, was financial planning. So all of the reports that we run to help families determine whether they can afford to retire, they're all updated daily within eMoney, which is a pretty impressive tool and a pretty impressive fact that all of your assets and debts can come into a software and populate your financial plan every single day. You shouldn't look at it every day, but it's nice to know that the information is in there and tracked. Jamie, we have another question here on trusts. You referenced that there are a couple different types of trusts. How can we tell what type of trust that we have? Uh, good question. Uh, it's actually not that easy. Uh, I've actually had, in the title of the trust, I've had clients say, like, it, maybe it's the Jamie Upson Revocable Trust, and when they pass away, you normally think that a revocable trust becomes irrevocable, but yet the title on the trust many times does not change. So I could have an irrevocable trust for somebody that's already passed away and the title of that trust actually says revocable. So, you know, I think that gets the point across that these things can be a bit confusing. The, the two major categories are uh, revocable trusts, which, are, which you're allowed to make changes to. You can dissolve it. They're flexible uh, versus the other type of trust, which is uh, irrevocable or other people call it irrevocable. Uh, those terms are set in stone and they do not allow you to make alterations or adjustments to the trust document. Typically what happens is a revocable trust is created and then when they pass away or when some kind of triggering event happens, which again is usually when they pass, that trust converts to an irrevocable trust. Since you're no longer able to make changes to that because you passed away, you sort of want those provisions to be locked in. And that's what an irrevocable trust does. Uh, it is important to point out that a lot of people do think that they have trusts that were created to help protect against nursing homes. As I said, I'm going to be talking about nursing homes at a later webinar. Uh, and in reality, they don't. If you have a revocable trust, uh, that really, the majority of times that, that attorneys or clients have used a, a revocable trust is simply to avoid probate. Uh, it's a valid reason to have a trust. It's a good idea to have that. Uh, I'm not opposed to it by any means. Uh, however, it's, it's, it's not correct if people that have a revocable trust that those assets in that revocable trust, if you have the ability to make changes to it, then the nursing home has the ability to demand that you pay, uh, use those assets to pay them. It's really the state that's requiring that because the state just says we're not going to help pay for your care if you have resources available. There are, it doesn't mean that there are different types of trusts that you can put money in and shelter those assets. Predominantly those are ir irrevocable trusts. So you have to put money into it, give up control and access to those assets. And by the way, you need to do that five years in advance of needing uh, Mass Health or, or Medicaid is what they call it nationally, but here in Mass we call it Mass Health. 
Um, so you can have those kind of trusts, but again, I would say that 95% of people have revocable trusts, and the primary reason and benefit of those is that you avoid probate. Uh, it does not protect against nursing homes. Um, switching gears here in relation to um, some education planning, you referenced 529 plans, so can you just elaborate what these are and what the benefits are? Yeah, good. Um, this was uh, something that they passed. I don't remember exactly when it was. It, I've been here for 17 years. It feels like it was maybe about 10 years ago that they created 529s, and it's something that Congress did right. Uh, they, there, there's no really hidden there's nothing hidden within these plans. As soon as people start asking questions, well, does it does th does it do this? Does it do that? Uh, the answer is yes and yes. Um, you, you put money into these five to nine college savings plans. There are 50 states, and each state uh, sponsors one or more than one plan. So there's a fair number of plans out there to choose from. Uh, you put money in. You don't get a tax break for putting the money in. Some states for their own uh, uh, residents do offer some, some uh, state tax deductions. So for example, Maine is one of those. So if we have clients in Maine, we have to consider using and should consider using the Maine plan because of the deduction that uh, the state of Maine uh, allows. Uh, you, you just got to look up each state uh, to see whether they offer that. In Massachusetts, Massachusetts does not offer uh, a state tax deduction for contributions to using the state's plan. So since there's no deduction for that, there's really no incentive to use the state of Mass plan. We would only use it if it was a great plan. Uh, it's unfortunately not a great plan in our in our view, so we've branched out and used a different state's plan. Uh, if you use another state's plan, it does not mean that your child needs to go to that that's to a school in that state, uh, which I think is an important distinction. Um, 529s, the, the real beauty of it is you put the money in, it grows tax deferred, which means that if you place a trade in the account you, and you have profits, you do not need to worry about paying taxes on that profit. And the best part about these is that as long as you use the money for its intended purpose, which is college, or graduate school, you cannot use these for high, private high school or private middle school, as long as you use it for college or graduate school, any of the profits that you've accrued over the years within these five to nine plans can come out of the account and pay for your college expenses, and that profit is tax-free. That is a huge, huge benefit. Uh, we have a lot of plans for our clients, not only the parents, but also the grandparents have set these plans up. Uh, it's, it's, again, something that Congress did right, uh, and they're a popular choice for good reason. There are some drawbacks when it comes to financial aid. Uh, as I mentioned before, David Giuliano, he's, he's, this is, he's, he's been consulting on education planning, five to nines, for a long time. And so, you know, if anybody has any questions, he's a great resource that we have available so that you should run, uh, run that by. So if you or your kids are focusing on financial aid eligibility, uh, I would suggest that you coordinate some time with David Giuliano because uh, he's a great resource for that. Jamie, the last question we have is just an extension kind of of what you were just finishing up there with. Um, can Stonehearth help with financial aid if that's something that our clients need? Yep. Again, good question. Thank you again for submitting those. Um, financial aid, we will consult and, and show you what uh, what is considered in the financial aid process. You know, the, when you break down financial aid, it's actually pretty straightforward. Uh, you, it, you have a cost of, of going to school, and then you have what's called the expected family contribution, which is the calculation uh, of what the government deems you having the ability to pay towards that education. So if the cost of college is $60,000 a year and your expected family contribution is $50,000 a year, then you can expect that you would receive some kind of financial aid in the amount of the delta there, which is about $10,000. Um, now, in fairness, most of that aid comes in the form of loans, not grants or free money, so you do need to pay these back. But loans are also an important part of the equation given the given the high cost uh, of attending college these days. Um, the, 
when it comes to financial aid planning, it's now going into and delving into the expected family contribution and what assets and what income is going to be included in that calculation. Now there are two different groups out there. There's FAFSA and there's the profile uh, financial aid system. Uh, FAFSA is the government's program and profile are, is, is a different system that uh, smaller numbers of colleges and universities use where they're predominantly loaning their own money and so they can ask different questions and they typically use this profile application. Uh, it is pretty detailed uh, and again we can help consult. We will not and cannot fill out and complete the forms for you but we can help you think through the issues and plan ahead to try if possible to put yourself in the best light when you file for financial aid benefits. If there are any other questions, uh, then please go ahead and submit them. You can always give us a call or send us an email. We're coming up on about 42 minutes after we started, uh, and I wanted to keep this within 45 minutes, so I think it'd be appropriate if we end it here. Again, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, I'll be, as I said, the white paper is right here on our website. If you need help or have any problems getting it, just let us know and we can always send it to you. Uh, thank you again for joining us. If anybody has any questions out there or would like to meet with us, if you're not currently a client, all of our initial consultations are free. We'd be happy to meet with you to discuss your financial goals. Thank you once again, everybody, for joining us. Have a great day.